My guest is a veteran thespian, entertainer, educator, and longtime collaborator of mine. In 25 seconds, Karen Murdoch joins me on this edition of RxG Exclusives. We must open up our You're watching RXG Exclusives. Oh, they try to keep us away, yeah. Karen, you're finally here. Uh, you were scheduled to appear in season one and, well, life. <laughs> <I've happened. laughs> so, glad we're finally able to do this. For five years and counting, every year for two weeks, you and I are the dynamic film instructing duo at the Rehoboth Summer Children's Theater Film Camp in Delaware. Robert and I have been working together. This is our fifth year uh, co-facilitating film camp. It's truly a highlight for me, as I know it is for you. It's always so fun and eye-opening for more than one reason, and I treasure our time and our program. The arts, particularly in schools, has long been under attack. Typically, it's the first to go when it comes to budgets, yet the arts literally saves lives. Can you share about your background in arts education and why you're compelled to help nurture young people? Oh, wow. <laughs> Loaded question. I'm old. You know that, right? Uh, you know, my education in the arts has typically not been in school, been outside of school, which is why I'm so amazed at what I find in school now. I, I work in a high school drama program. It's actually a Votech school that has a drama program as a as a technical line. And uh, the amount of attention and education that our kids get in in their field of acting every day of their school day, is so amazing to me. It's not something I grew up with. It's not something I understood as a student. And in fact, I went to an alternative high school, which in the 1970s meant kind of hippie school. Um, we had very loosey goosey and arts was part of how we thought about things, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. So um, every now and then we would do a play that was part of a class, but we didn't do theater as a rule. We didn't do sports as a rule. You know, it was just, it was very loosey-goosey. And so um, I was a dancer at the time. I was a ballet dancer at a young age, and uh, they were recruiting some um, chorus members for musicals in other schools from my dance studio. And that's kind of how in high school I got into theater, sort of in the back door into musicals through um, recruiting from our dance school. So now when I look at students who are studying theater for two hours out of their day in school, I'm amazed and uh, amazed at what they can accomplish and learn in four years of that curriculum. Now you work with children from all different backgrounds. I can attest to watching you in action with those who may be challenged in some way. Every kid is different and requires specific attention, uh, support, and discipline. How are you able to connect with them and make each one feel special? Uh, that's just about keying into the spirit, I think, a little bit. Um, I, I know you and I have had this conversation on, you know, the first 10 minutes of day one. And we'll look at each other and go, okay, I got the number on that one. I got the number on that one. But the caveat is, how many times have we been wrong? How many times have we kind of made a flash assessment that, you know, even by the end of day one in our mini little, you know, five days of, of working with these kids, do we say, wow, that was a surprise? You know, so it's really about, yes, maybe using your gut to make an assessment and to say, okay, I think this kid might need this kind of attention or this kind of uh, special spiritual bond. Um, but it's about continuing to listen so that those preconceived notions don't stick with you to the point of distraction and that we can say, all right, at the end of day one, we might need to think about this a different way. And the beginning of day two, we might need to think about it yet another way. And the end of two, we might need to still more 
how we deal with that kid. So I think it's, yeah, it's a little bit about assessing an initial need, but it's mostly about continually, continually nonstop listening, observing, feeling, thinking, and questioning where we are with each kid individually. Sometimes that's harder than others. You know, we have, uh, we've had seven kids, to, you know, in a class and we've had 22 kids in a class for five days. And so sometimes it's a little harder than others, but I think continuing to assess and process and analyze where we are in any given moment helps us to keep moving <laughs> in, in a good direction that results in good product at the end. Absolutely. I never expected when I left the corporate world that I'd be in the position of seeing kids through their high school career in theater. You know, as the production stage manager for every production that we do every year, for four years from somebody's freshman year to the minute they leave the school at senior year, I've seen all of that evolution and progression from the very beginning to the very end. And I cannot even tell you how incredible an experience that's been. And I never knew that I'd be an educator in that way. I never knew that I'd have that, that kind of influence, that kind of impact on kids in those formative theatrical years. And it's just, it's such a joy and so unexpected. I, who knew? Who knew? As an actor and singer, your credits include Gypsy, A Little Night Music, Next to Normal, and Nine, just to name a few. Your accomplishments in theater date back to your young adult years. When did you discover that you had a gift? And who inspired you? Who helped nurture your dreams? Oh, wow. I did not really know I had a gift as a singer till very late in my young adulthood, honestly. Probably more the beginning of my older adulthood. But there is a significant moment. I, I went to school in Germany as an exchange student for... Um, a semester and oh, see, something you didn't know <laughs> and um and I was a very very shy teenager something else you might not you know. yes I was incredibly <laughs> shy incredibly shy as a child and incredibly shy as a uh, as a teenager almost into my senior year of high school and I went to school in Germany between my junior and senior year of high school and um I lived with a German family. I spoke nothing but German at the time um, with that family because I was a German student. And I was with a whole bunch of kids that I didn't know when we got there. We all went to school together and they all came from different parts of the country. And some of them were incredibly displaced and lonely, just feeling so homesick and so out of sorts. Some were even placed with German families who didn't speak the same dialect of German that we were learning as German students in the United States, which was a little, I got lucky, but um, some kids not so lucky. So they were just feeling so lost. And it was the summer of 1976, which was bicentennial summer in Philadelphia that I missed, by the way, because I was in Germany. And I organized a 4th of July bash with my parents in Germany. And um, I sang at this bash. I don't know why I did it. I have no idea what compelled me to do it, but I did. And it, it had such a profound effect on people in the class. They felt instantly more at home. They felt calmed. They felt like they were, um, they had something to cling to a little bit, which was odd for me because all I did was sing. But in, in the weeks after that, people would ask me to sing all the time. They just wanted to feel better. And so they asked me to sing. And I just didn't understand it. I didn't know why they were asking me to sing. And in retrospect, that was the moment where I realized that singing a song with passion and feeling and intensity could make a difference in how somebody viewed the world in that moment. And I didn't know it then, and it took me lots of years after that to figure out how valuable that was. But it, that was the moment. That was the moment that turned around. And I was like 16 years old. Wow. And I still don't know how to sing really well. But, you know, I learned how to sing much later in life. But uh, that, that was the moment, I think, that I knew that I could sing in a special way. I did theater in high school 
at other schools, not at my own. Um, and I was a dancer, as I said, and I always was cast in the chorus. I didn't get lead roles because I was a strong singer. And so many people who were dancers weren't strong singers and they needed somebody in the chorus who could basically carry it, <laughs> you know, they carry it with a strong vocal. And so I, 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 it took me a while to bust out of that, but it did eventually. Well, you already know that I think you have a beautiful singing voice. It's very powerful. Who are some of your musical influences and are there any plans to record an album someday? <laughs> I think every day I wake up and say, I'm going to record an album someday. So I, that doesn't constitute a plan. <laughs> That's more like a wish. But yeah, I, I, I have done some recording um, and I love recording. I don't have lots of opportunity for that right now, but I, um, yeah, I would say there's a loosey goosey plan to have an album someday. Getting old though, I better do it soon. Um, but uh, gosh, musical influences, so many. Um, I, my heart is in jazz and blues. Uh, that's probably my favorite stuff to sing besides God, I love a Broadway tune, you know that, but, um, but that soulful, really being able to get into a song, um, really tell a story song, that's my passion. Um, there are lots of artists who do that. Katie Lang is one of my favorite singers of all time. I just think she has a perfect voice. So technically, I like to, I like to listen to her and I like to study that. I've actually never studied music, um, which is, you know, I, I wish I had, I, I wish I, I wish I will. Um, but I have learned a lot by listening, by osmosis, by practicing, by doing, um, which is how I've learned most of the stuff I know. But um, sometimes that's the strongest way. It, it, honestly, I've had a lot of years of, of doing that. And I didn't sing for a living until about 13 years ago. You know, I have a background in corporate America and I got downsized for too many times in 10 years. And be, just because that's the way corporate America works, I was in the organizational development and training, learning and development, and um, all those human resources, fluffy jobs are the first to go when there's cuts to be made. So I lost, you know, I got downsized a lot of times and uh, I finally decided to just see what else I wanted to do for a living instead of that's when I started um, doing what we do, doing camps, teaching, stage managing at GCIT, which I do now for 13 years, um, and singing in restaurants, mostly in Rehoboth Beach. And um, I've developed my skill by doing. I've developed my repertoire, certainly. I've developed my confidence. Uh, 13 years ago, when I first started singing in front of people in an environment like a restaurant or a club room, it, it, was, it was a little scary. I had done lots of theater, but I hadn't done that. And that was, a, that was a learning opportunity because there's no character to hide behind. There's no script to hide behind. There's no proscenium. You know, it's just me and a song. And it turned out to be the thing I love best, just me and a song. Now, before you walk on a stage for a performance, how do you prepare? And is there a difference between preparing to go on as an actor and preparing to go on to give a concert? There is a, there is a difference. Um, it's, it's a subtle difference. I'm a person who absolutely needs my, you know, quiet time in the wings um, as an actor. I'm, you know, if, if my five minute call gets missed, I'm a mess. You know, I just, I have to know, you know, I have to have my space in the space. Um, you know, I, and I teach that to the kids as a stage manager, you know, I'm very, very specific with my time calls and I'm very specific with what the expectation is in the dressing room when it's half hour, when it's 15 minutes, when it's five minutes. And a lot of the times, you know, I'm calling five, but I'm also saying, guys, you goofy kids listen to this crazy music in the, in the dressing room. It's time to focus down. Now it's time to understand and be in the play, whatever it is. And you'll be so much better and so much happier and so much more in focus and on target if you use your calls to start to get into the world of the play. As an actor, that's what I do. 
And uh, it's really important to me. It's really important to me that I get that time. As a singer, <laughs> I'm often dragging my gear in, setting it up, you know, putting the microphone on, reading the room, saying, all right, what's the median age in here? What do I start with? Where's the energy? Reading the room in terms of getting what, what's the sense of the room? What do they want to hear? I have no idea. You know, I don't sing every single song in the universe. So I really have to get a, a, an idea of where the room is. So I'm assessing all of that stuff. I hit the button and I pick up the microphone and I just hope to God the voice is there and hope to God the song is there. Usually is. And then I, as a singer, constantly read the room. The singing part is easy. The getting the song out is easy. I'm looking at what people are responding to. There's no script to tell me what's going to happen next. I have to create that script constantly, reevaluate, reassess, and figure out, and then do the mechanics of, okay, they're, re they're, they're listening to this kind of thing. They're jamming on that. All right, let, what song could I, okay, I got it. Then I got to find it, put it in the iPad, get it up. And so I'm constantly stage managing myself as I'm singing. I do get a chance to get into that moment of the song when I'm in it, but it's not the whole song because I'm prepping, you know, I'm prepping before and I'm prepping after in the middle of the song so that I can move on to the next kind of seamlessly, give that, keep the mood that's going in the room. And when you're working with tracks, which I often do, um, I've got to be the technician at the same time. When I'm working with a piano player, um, and it's funny because my, my friend John that plays uh, with me a lot, um, he kind of is the technician. He just chooses what's next and I trust him. And I trust that he's not going to play something I've never heard before. Uh, I trust that he's going to, you know, give a safety net to some degree. Um, but I don't have to think as much. I don't have to think about what I'm going to do next. He just plays it and God willing, I sing it. I mean, otherwise that is the epitome of multitasking there. It, it is, it is. And I don't like to, I don't like to leave too much space. I don't like to lose the audience. People comment all the time that, you know, I sing for three hours and I don't break. And that's kind of uncommon. Um, one of the reasons I don't break is because I don't want to lose my own energy. And as I mentioned, you know, I could go to sleep in a heartbeat. Um, but the other reason is that I don't want to lose the room. And I don't want to have to ramp up the room again, because that's a lot of work. You know, once you have them, keep them. And if you've got the, the vocal prowess to do it, I don't get tired because I sing correctly. So there's not, there's not going to be time three, into three hours where all of a sudden I have no voice. Because I sing correctly, I, I can sustain it. But um, I don't want to lose the energy of the room. All right. about retention. For sure. Absolutely. Retain yeah. the room. Keep them going. In order to connect with the characters that you portray, do you pull from your own life experiences or is there another way that you're able to tap into those psyches? Uh, experience is not as much as just emotional ties because I have played lots of crazy people. <laughs> I, play, I play, you, you know, um, really, off the charts. I played not very many um, average people, you know? And so you wonder like, hey, I'm gonna, I played Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd. You know, how do you connect to Mrs. Lovett? I mean, she's making meat pies out of people. Where's my connection to Mrs. Lovett? I'm not doing that. I don't have any experience. But when you find the, um, the thing that drives Mrs. Lovett, that's where I can find similarities with myself. She's passionate, she's resourceful, she's committed. You know, she's a lot of things that Karen is. I just don't express those things in making meat pies out of people, but I do understand what that is. And so usually I find connections, not so much in experiences, but with, I find the emotional drive of somebody and then I connect to that. Now we performers are often known to talk or sing to ourselves, roll around on the floor in clusters. <laughs> pretend to be elephants in heat, or make several loud, unintelligible noises. I'm sure many conclusions are drawn about what's happening in our worlds. For those who aspire to act, is losing every inhibition required? And how do you get actors new or seasoned to unleash themselves? 
I don't think that losing inhibitions is necessary. I think taking risk is. I think being comfortable enough in your own skin to take risks and to do different kinds of things is critical. I think being emotionally available is even more critical. So I'm not a roll around on the ground making noises kind of actor. I'm much more internal than that. And I'm also not the greatest improv actor in the world. I really aspire to scripts and form. That's, that's kind of my strength. Improv acting is not my strength. Um, but having said that, I do take a lot of risks as an actor. And I think that for me, that's more about being emotionally available. I'm okay with being vulnerable. And I think, I think that that is key, being able to express yourself um, and, and being that vulnerable, being able to communicate that to another actor, face-to-face, eye-to-eye, but also to an audience if you're in the, in the position of doing that. And I've been in the position in um, lots of places that I've done in a very small space, the black box, in the round, doing really large things, very close to people who I could alienate if I wasn't connected to them. And I, and so the only way to connect um, to them being so large, for, for instance, Mama Rose was in the round in a small space. Mama Rose is a very large human and there's no way to get around that. She's just large. And she could make people uncomfortable if, if we let that happen. But if we, if we really connect to the, those people in the audience and really draw them in, in a way that makes them feel like they're part of that thing, that's going to that's gonna be a better communication. And that's what theater is to me. It's just communicating, communicating a story, but also communicating lots of emotion. So that takes me being comfortable enough and vulnerable enough to let somebody into that, to let somebody be close enough for that. And I, I saw this this past year, last year, um, our freshmen in the, in the high school, we, we did our freshman show. And I found the freshmen so different last year. I found them not as emotionally vulnerable as they needed to be on stage. There was, they were, and there was not a lot of eye contact. There wasn't a lot of sharing. There wasn't a lot of physical or emotional communication going on on stage. And I thought, what is going on here? And I realized, that none of those kids gone to school for two years, mm. particularly middle school. Okay, so these are freshmen. So they, they didn't go to like seventh and eighth grade. And that's the time when you get all of your drama <laughs> to the surface, deal with it, you get all your frenemies and you do all of your crying and your weeping and your lashing and your gnashing of teeth and all of that stuff. And then you go to high school and then you got to kind of buck up a little bit. And these kids had never been through that. They had been to middle school on a Zoom meeting, you know? And so they weren't connected. And they're theater students, acting students who really want to do that. So it's a stretch for this class, you know, that this, you know, four-year class that just started last year to learn and grow through this aborted experience they've had connecting with other human beings. And I think that is much more critical, that emotional connection than rolling around and, you know, on the floor and screaming, you know, acting like an elephant. I think it's much more important to explore your yourself and get strong enough in yourself so that you can share that depth. And in a lot of cases with the parts that I played, the ugliness. And that's been really hard. I played a lot of ugly, crazy characters. And they're always very, they're always a little traumatic, you know? And it's because you're you're getting close enough to the ugly and nobody wants to think they're ugly. You know, nobody wants to think they're horrible or selfish or, you know, whatever these characters are. I play Joanne and company. She's hideous. You know, Mama Rose is really off. She's really not nice, <laughs> you know? And um, although I, I love Mrs. Lovett very, very much, she's also a little off the charts. So um, getting people to believe that, that you are that takes some uh, courage. 
Well, that brings me to this next point. The last couple of years have brought much to the surface in this country and world. Have recent current events affected how you move about as a person and as an artist? Initially, I, I think we all built walls to a certain degree because there was so much need for protection in general, protection of yourself, protection of your own, of your tribe, your people, your thing, um, that I think the walls that, that were built were natural defense mechanisms. Um, I'm really about breaking down walls as soon as possible. <laughs> so I think I've, I, I sometimes think about this and I think, should I be more, um, reserved? Should I be more cautious? Should I? And I'm like, it's just really not you, Karen. You break down walls. That's what you do. You bust through things. Um, and I think, I think that that's what I've done. So I don't think it affects me anymore. And I think that the walls were very uncomfortable for me. And I think that, you know, for me, getting out of it as soon as possible was the, was the key. Now, some folks might be surprised to learn that women and LGBT artists have long fought for more positive representation and opportunities in the arts. As a member of those communities yourself, what's your perspective? Have you seen a significant improvement or is there still much work to be done? Oh gosh, there's always a lot more work to be done. But um, again, I'm gonna harken back to my students. Right now, when I look at high school students, theater students, drama kids, and I see the variety and diversity in gender and sexual identity that exists with these kids right now, it, I, I can't even express how amazing that is to me. I'm 63 years old. I grew up in a world where um, we just didn't talk about those things. And we just, you know, and frankly, I can pass, which is terrible. And that's a, that's a whole nother episode passing. Um, and often I did, often I, I did by, you know, just kind of go, oh, all right, I'm just not gonna deal with that. I'm not gonna deal with, you know, when somebody says, Where, where's your husband or, you know, and I say I'm married and they say, oh, what does your husband do? You know, I've learned in, in, um, in very recent years to, to answer that honestly. But in many of my years, I just let it pass. And the kids that I am working with now and in the last few years, I mean, this has been an, you know, an evolution really, um, we don't pass anymore. We don't, we just are very, very honest. And I'm honest with the kids that I work with um, and, the, and the other teacher that I work with who's also lesbian and married and young. Um, we are just very, very open. And it's for me, for her, it's just like, yeah, it's just what they do. She's young. You know, for me, it's still jarring. And for me to now watch television and see so much representation, you know, it's like, okay, it's still a little special, you know? You know, it's like, uh, it's still, it still opens eyes. We're not to the point where we just say, oh, that's just a normal family, you know? Do, do, you think, do you think that it's forced still? Less so. I, I mean, less so, I think, I, and I think that um, uh, streaming helps that because I, I, I think that, you know, Netflix and Hulu and those, the shows that are, that are designed on those networks have more freedom and relaxation about everybody. I think, you know, networks, you know, the major networks, they're still cautious and it's still eye popping, you know, it's still, oh my gosh, you know, and I just think about this, the stuff I was reading about people complaining about the Lord of the Rings prequel that's on now, which by the way, I love and saying, you know, complaining that there are no black elves. Well, there are no elves. <laughs> so, I mean, really, I mean, I think there are elves, but, you know, but, you know, it's like there's so much more freedom in casting on on those streaming networks. 
they're not um, they're not as honed in on what's the general public going to accept. And the goofballs that say there are no black elves, well, we just can we we can kind of laugh at them now, but still, it exists. It's true. There are people out there who think there are no, um, you know, gay families that are normal. You know that that it's all still very special and unique. It's not special and unique to be gay or black or Chinese or whatever. But what you know, but there is that there's that perception, and there, it's still out there. But I I think it has advanced. I'm hoping it doesn't stop advancing, but you know, that's where we are in the world. Well, Karen, for those who'd like to support your artistry, what's the best way they can follow your career? Um, Facebook, mostly. Um, I'm very not tech savvy in terms of promoting myself out there. Um, but most of the restaurants that I work in in Hobie Beach are. So if you if you Google me or if you uh, Facebook put my name in Karen Murdoch, you'll find me somewhere. I'll be singing some song in some restaurant and you'll be strolling by and get a glimpse. Well, thank you so much, Karen. It's always a pleasure chatting it up with you. My pleasure, Robert. Thanks. And thank you for watching RXG Exclusives. Make sure to like, comment, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you never miss out. RxG Exclusives, hosted by Robert X. Golfin, now playing.